What's up guys? Happy holiday season. We have finally made it to the end of 2020. That's gonna be a cheers from me this year. So I realized the other day that I have not done a Q&A video for a very long time. So I thought today would be a good day to do that. It's like cozy in here. There are a few questions that a ton of people ask, so I'm gonna save those toward the end. My friend Mem says, hey, more puppy on film, please. Um, she may make an appearance here. She's an independent woman, so I don't wanna force it. B, I love you. It's very sweet, I love you too. And C, with the chaos of 2020, what's one or two things you've started doing for your mental health or mindfulness? The main thing that I really committed myself to is meditation more, and also I found that taking Poppy to the dog park is like the best antidepressant ever. It's just like a swirl of puppies. I would say people who don't have dogs who need a little pick-me-up should go to dog parks too, but I don't, I don't know if that's weird. Adam Sandler's Stan account asks, are you staying hydrated? Obviously, I do actually try to drink eight cups of water a day, but otherwise I'm powered by wine and coffee. <laughs> but Nose asks, how do you feel about public relationships, any of yours or others? I had a public relationship once. I would say that the benefit of such a thing is that you can kind of like enjoy each other's creativity and make stuff together when you're YouTubers. But outside of that, I feel like there are a lot of downsides to having a public relationship. People get very invested. That's great if everything's going well for both of you and you know, life is good. But obviously that's not always the case. And I think it can be hard for teenagers and stuff who have public relationships to deal with the public aspects of it. Ultimate Apathy asks, what would you be doing if you weren't doing YouTube? I would be doing more of what I'm doing when I'm not doing YouTube, <laughs> which right now is a lot of reading and writing and research and um, a bit of coding too. Do you think you will ever start an OnlyFans account? It was jarring to me coming back from my social media break and realizing that like every YouTuber I watch does porn now. <laughs> I mean, good for them. If everyone's happy, no one's getting hurt, whatever. But no, that is uh, not my line of work. Another one of my friends, Bunty, he says, how do you hit the record button and silence your inner, sometimes negative narrative? I think it's really easy for a lot of us to kind of get stuck in this really, this rut of self-criticism, right? And to become consumed with all of the things that we're doing wrong. In that situation, I think it's important to recognize A, that it's good to be a little bit self-critical. I think that's something that conscientious people do. They can see kind of where their weaknesses are, where there are opportunities of growth. So the magic is in knowing when you're crossing the self-criticism line, identifying when it's becoming unproductive, self-defeating, and then yeeting it away. It's a very important skill to know how to yeet things in this year 2020. Bruno and several other people have asked, you know, have you been doing any more sex ed research or work? What happened to sex plus, the, the sex ed thing? I guess I, I wasn't super duper clear about, you know, why did I shift away from sex ed? There are a few reasons. I'm gonna put down my wine glass because I feel like I need to use my hands right now. <laughs> um, one of the biggest reasons was that when you think about all of the material that is in a sex ed class, you know, a comprehensive sex ed class, um, you're probably looking at a couple years worth, um, you know, in the, the adult level. And at some point I just felt like I had covered a lot, if not all of the things that I felt like I could cover. And eventually the questions that I was getting both from you guys professionally in the media were, questions that I did not feel qualified answering. Things about trauma, things about, you know, medical issues. The New York Times actually even asked me to, you know, answer sexology questions. So I had this realization that if I'm gonna pursue sex ed as, you know, my life's work, I need to become an expert in something related to sexuality. And the thought of going into that realm honestly didn't appeal to me that much. <laughs> I love these topics. It's just not my everything. There are many parts of me and a love of sex ed is just one. Adrastia asks the difficult questions. Which is more important, tailbones or kneecaps? Let me just say that I have literally never thought about how important my tailbone was until this moment. I feel like I get through my day fine. Do I need that energy? Do I need that tailbone energy in my life? I don't know, I have questions about that. 
Kneecaps though, I feel like a lot of things would hurt. Sea Otter asks, can you go over the best ways in ranking that we as viewers can help content providers beside Patreon or PayPal? That's a really thoughtful question, Sea Otter. To me, the most important way to support content creators is just to watch their work and to share it with people you think would like it. Cyrus the Virus asks, do you have an innie or an Audi? I have an innie. But I've always thought that Audis were kind of cute. Audis are like actual belly buttons. Like they look like a button. Innies are just like, what, a belly hole? Belly hole. Oh no. I regret ever thinking about this. Chance and a lot of people <laughs> actually asked about my politics. You know, where my politics are, have my politics changed, how I feel about online activism these days. Thank you so much for all the simple, not loaded questions. <laughs> Something that I feel like I've repeated ad nauseum at this point is that no, my politics haven't really changed. You know, I, I took the political compass test a few days ago. It's almost exactly the same unit, same mark as it was five years ago. I would say that the main difference between now and you know five, 10, really 10 years ago is that I'm much more open to other perspectives now. Um, I find myself seeing the merits in a lot of different viewpoints, even if I don't personally subscribe to those viewpoints. And this is especially true when it comes to, you know, what people describe as like woke activism, woke politics. Um, I do find myself kind of questioning some of the methods of that form of activism. For instance, you know, one of the things that I've talked about before in the past is sort of this growing comfort with censorship and authoritarianism in order to achieve political goals. There's literally, okay, maybe not literally, but there is almost literally no discussion about, you know, how some of these same exact tools, censorship has been used in the past. It's been disturbing watching some of these liberal strongholds like the ACLU sort of soften or retreat from you know, their free speech positions that they had defended for years. And, and part of me wonders, like, is the, is the problem that these activist organizations are becoming a little bit too online? You know, they're compromising some of their core values and in doing so, they're compromising their ability to really speak to the average American. I really like how Andrew Yang has talked about this issue, actually. He, you know, points out that there's a, a lot of focus on policing cultural attitudes in the Democratic Party and not enough focus on materially improving the lives of people of the working class, a word on class, because I think that's important here too. You know, the American feminist conversation today is largely driven by corporate media. And I know this firsthand because I dipped my toes in that pool. I have turned down six figure salaries at, you know, fancy media companies who want me to talk about you know, social justice and stuff, because something about that just doesn't sit right with me. I used to just be happy to get paid to talk about what I believe, but I noticed like a bigger insidious sort of machine taking place and I, I didn't and don't want to be a part of that machine. There are so many, you know, media executives and people with cushy jobs who are just slapping a rainbow on their logo, you know, selling the future as female t-shirts and, you know, pumping out an avalanche of think pieces and hot takes that are specifically meant to incite outrage. Teen Vogue before 2017 was a sinking media company. And then they brought on a new editor who decided that wokeness was gonna be Teen Vogue's brand. And look what happened, hugely successful. Are there good things that come out of that? Of course. Are there also sort of sinister feel baddie things that come with something like that? Yeah. And obviously it's not just Teen Vogue, like celebrities and influencers across the political spectrum. You know, people have realized that there's so much content to mine out of, you know, stirring up these culture wars. They manufacture cultural division and then, you know, they tell members of their own tribe how right and moral they are and how horrible the other tribe is. And it goes viral because it appeals to, you know, our tribalism, we're, we're human, and it, it appeals to our need to feel like we're part of something, that we're helping to make the world a better place. We all want to feel like we're doing that, right? The most, you know, horrific injustices of our day are not sexy and they don't sell magazines. 
and they don't get clicks. Material injustices like, like poverty or sex trafficking or homelessness, you know, those are issues that make us feel bad. They make us feel powerless. They're very complicated problems that, you know, can't be solved by publicly shaming the celebrity of the day or the company of the day. They can't be solved with hashtags. Poppy obviously agrees with me, by the way. Wow, this has been a rant. I apologize. <laughs> um, I'll just say that the future of activism, in my opinion, isn't going to be led by Vox writers or YouTube bloggers. It's happening on the ground in our local communities. That is where the real heroes are. Those are the people who are working directly to make the lives of people around them better. Obviously, I think the internet is a hugely important tool. I think it's great for organizing. I think it's great for education. I think it's great for getting the word out, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I do think it's a mistake to treat the internet as some kind of silver bullet that is going to make society better. I think that in some ways, it's making things worse. That's why I started Indirect Message, you know, to, to think critically about the tools, about the methods, about everything. Just think critically, that's my advice. All right, let's do a few more questions. Jay Tizzle asks, if you were a train, where do you get off? Hmm, oh my God, I love the idea of just getting on a train and getting off somewhere amazing. I've been in my house for eight months, <laughs> maybe more, I've lost count. My ideal train stop would be somewhere with lots of trees, big trees, huge trees, and some waterfalls too, very important. Actually, you know what? I might I might be thinking of Rivendell. I definitely had a Hobbit marathon the other day, so it's fresh on the mind. Dre Meets World asks, what's your best advice for someone who feels stuck in life and is struggling to get started? Mm, I have experienced that feeling. I would say try to follow the heat. Follow the things that make you excited. Figure out what that is if you don't know what that is. And then pursue it and do it and let it inspire you, let it motivate you. Sometimes it can be helpful to talk to a counselor. There's no shame in it, so I would certainly suggest that. The last sort of major genre of question is about Chris. What happened, you guys? I loved you guys. Very sweet. Gosh, we broke up more than two years ago at this point. So um, I know I was gone for a lot of that. So that's probably why I'm still getting these questions and I never fully addressed it publicly, but yeah, nothing dramatic or horrible or crazy happened. We just sort of decided that we weren't compatible as romantic partners. That said, Chris is one of my best friends and I adore the shit out of him. My fur baby loves him and you know, we, we talk all the time and I, I see him fairly often. I just saw him last week, actually. Actually, oh my God, this is a really weird story. We went hiking the other day and the next day in the news, the exact place where we were hiking, they found a dead body. Is Chris to blame? Maybe. Isn't that stressful? I was like, of course we'd go hiking somewhere and a dead body would turn up later. It's actually very horrible and tragic. That was the last time we hung out. Anyways, what was I talking about? Chris, not murder. Really grateful that Chris was receptive to, you know, being friends and building a friendship because not everyone can or wants to do that um, when you decide to break up. And he did, and I'm grateful for that. On that note, I feel like I've been talking a lot my drink is almost empty. I hope that answered some of your questions and helped you guys feel up to speed. If you like this, we can do more Q and A's and yeah, I like that. It feels more like, you know, talking with you guys. Oh God, she's chewing on the wires. I gotta go, love y'all, bye.